Well, it's good to be here with you guys. My name is Clint Gresham. I spent six years with the Seattle Seahawks. I always tell people it was six years longer than I expected to. I'd walk in and just think, are you guys sure? <laughs> but I was able to trick those guys for six years and had an amazing experience. And uh, Chad talked briefly about, you know, stories about Marshawn Lynch. I'll tell you all a quick one that is, it kind of encapsulates who Marshawn is. Everybody on the team loved Marshawn. We were in Detroit in 2012. And on a Saturday morning, we were driving over to go have our walkthrough. And I was on the offensive bus, and Marshawn, he was, he was towards the back, and Russell Wilson was probably about two rows in front of him. And <laughs> Marshawn loved messing with Russell, just like giving him a hard time. And uh, so Marshawn, he's over in the back, he's like, hey, yo, Russ, hey, yo, Russ, safe for shizzle, dog. <laughs> And, and Russell's like, Marshawn, stop it. I'm not going to say for shizzle, okay? Because Russell is very polished and anyways, it was hilarious. He said some other stuff that I actually can't say here. I probably shouldn't. <laughs> I promise you I shouldn't. But it's an honor to be here speaking for Wingmen. I uh, had a great time being over in Dallas and up in McKinney today. And, uh, but more than anything, it is an honor to be in a room full of ravenous Seahawks fans. Am I right? <laughs> Gosh, the green and blue goes for miles. <laughs> but thank you, Chad, for having me. I love this ministry and what it's doing to empower and equip men. And uh, look forward to continuing to see what God does here this morning. Uh, my sweet wife, Maddie, and I have been married for four years. And it is the absolute best. Uh, we live over in Dallas. We have two kids together, Zoe and Bear. That's my sweet baby girl. It's the best. And Bear is a dog, if you don't realize that. Um, and I'm super proud. My daughter, she's sleeping through the night. And my son is no longer pooping in the house, which is always a win. <laughs> I'm so proud. There's us, our first little lake trip. Oh, it's amazing. Um, being a dad is amazing. Uh, our, my daughter, it's so funny, she's, she's starting to say all kinds of words. Uh, her first words were mama, which as you guys probably could assume was the right answer. Honestly, I was a little afraid it might have been a cuss word because she, when she was around me, when the Patriots won another Super Bowl, which was painful, and for those who don't realize, uh, you know, I was in Super Bowl 49 uh, against the New England Patriots, and we're on the one yard line. We're like this far away from winning back to back Super Bowls, and we get picked off in the end zone, and it was a terrible experience. After the game, I actually went into the locker room, and Coach Carroll said a couple of words to the team, and he looks at me, he's like, okay, Gresh, go ahead and pray for us now. And I'm like, ugh. No pressure. Um, God, please let them not win another one. Curse them. <laughs> I don't know what to say. I'm stuck. Run the football. <laughs> Give it to Marshawn. <laughs> Lord, I pray we run the ball next time. Y'all got that part. That's good. Whenever I talk about that up in Seattle, everyone's like, yes, we hate the Patriots. We have one here. Can we all boo this man real quick? <laughs> boo! <laughs> uh, <laughs> we're going to pray for him to repent. <laughs> Today, I want to talk about leading with courage. Leading with courage. How God never calls the qualified, but he qualifies the called. And you know, sometimes I think that we forget that we're dying. You know, that Jesus is going to return soon that the Bible is true, that we're going to have to give an account for our life, and then out of the blue, one day, Jesus is going to return, and we won't have any more opportunities to do anything different. It's like, this, is, this right now is the youngest we will ever be. And now this is the youngest we will ever be. <laughs> and so on, and so on, and so on. And, and, you know, that isn't to shame us at all, but we do have to realize that the truth sets us free. When I was playing with the Seahawks, we, um, we had something called Tell the Truth Monday. And so we'd come in after the game on Sunday, we're gonna go over the good, we're gonna go over the bad, but we're going to get to the truth of it. And it was painful at times. But that pain, that discomfort allowed us to auto-correct 
and to do something different so that we could go on to be successful. And Jesus said this, the truth sets us free. And you know, when God created all of us, he created us with a purpose in mind. It's like he had something that he wanted to do on the earth, and he thought to himself, what is going to be the answer to that? Well, obviously I am, but how am I going to do it? I'm going to do it through people. It's like the Holy Spirit wrote the word of God through people. God only does things on the earth through partnership with mankind. You know, we're, we're called co-laborers with Christ because God wants fellowship. You know, all of us are running this race. All of us have something in front of us because God saw this problem and thought, oh, I'm going to make this person to, to solve this problem. And that should inspire us because it gives us such a profound sense of purpose. But I believe that we draw back from our calling for two reasons. First of all, maybe we don't realize that we're running a race. It's like we're just walking down the street and all these people are whizzing past us. Like, wow, what's going on here? <laughs> we're running a race. And then two, we allow thoughts of defeat and insecurity to rob our confidence. But I have really good news. Those thoughts of defeat and insecurity and doubt, and feeling like we may not be enough, those things are actually the prerequisite for doing anything for God. It's true. All of those things are almost required of us because then it's God who gets the glory. We're going to be reading in Matthew 28, 1 through 8, and then 16 through 20. And uh, I'm going to be reading it, and uh, you can follow along on the giant sky Bible. <laughs> and it says, Now after the Sabbath, as the first day of the week began to dawn, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat on it. His countenance was like lightning, and his clothing as white as snow, and the guards shook for fear of him, and became like dead men. But the angel answered and said to the woman, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus, who was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen, as he said. Come see the place where the Lord lay, and go quickly and tell his disciples he is risen from the dead, and indeed he is going before you into Galilee. There you will see him. So they went out quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to bring the, his disciples' word. Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee to the mountain which Jesus had appointed for them. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. That's like the most amazing thing in Scripture to me. Here you have these guys for three years. They're actually walking with God. Jesus tells them, hey, I'm going to die, and then I'm going to come back to life. And then he actually goes and meets his disciples, and his disciples are sitting there looking at Jesus, feeling his body, seeing holes in his hands, and they're like, I don't know. <laughs> That's crazy to me. And it so encourages me because then it's like, okay, I can give myself a break. If those guys struggle with doubt, I'm going to be all right. And Jesus came and spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all of the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, of the Son, of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for this morning. Thank you for this opportunity to gather around your word. God, I pray that you would speak to us, apply the word to our lives and send the plagues of Egypt upon the patriots. Amen. <laughs> Jesus said, if any of you agree on anything, it will be done. <laughs> so by a show of hands, how many of you have ever been punched in the face? Oh, dear God, it's a good thing y'all are here then. <laughs> I've been punched in the face twice. The first time, I was at this UT football camp. I was probably 11 years old. I was a huge fan of the University of Texas Longhorns. My dad played football 
for UT back in the 70s. He actually played football with some no-name guy named Earl Campbell. You know, not that successful of a running back. And so I, we went to all the games when I was a kid, and I loved it. And um, so I'm at this camp, and a buddy of mine, we decided we're going to go mess with some people. And so we were going around, and we were banging on people's doors, and we were running off. And so I'm getting, I'm getting ready to get on the bus, and this dude comes up to me, and he's like, hey, man, I heard you were messing with me. And he's like, you keep coming out and banging on my door. But the thing was, I wasn't banging on his door. I was banging on somebody else's door. I wasn't messing with this guy. And all of a sudden, out of the blue, he just punches me. And I'm such a gangster back then. He punches me in the face, and this is how 11-year-old Clint responded. I said, did you just punch me? <laughs> like, that's pretty awesome. That's pretty awesome. You wuss, I'm going to let you go this time. <laughs> the second time I got punched in the face, it, uh, it was a little bit more intense. I was, uh, I was at this concert, and uh, it was a rock show, and so there was like a mosh pit going on. And so I'm just like jumping around in this mosh pit, having a good time, and I'm like rounding the corner, and this one guy had, had kind of been messing with me all night, like being a little bit too aggressive on me personally, and as I'm rounding the corner, he just sucker punches me, just like out of the blue, just bop, and so it stuns me, and I just reacted. I took all 170 pounds of myself, and I threw my fist into his face, and I hit him, and he ended up stumbling and he fell on the ground and actually the lead singer of the concert was like, hey, stop that guy. I'm like, okay, I gotta get out of here. <laughs> so I grabbed all my buddies and we ran off and uh, the guy ended up getting hurt. Obviously, he, I actually broke his cheekbone because uh, I lift weights. <laughs> <laughs> and um, you know, when I think about that story, I, I obviously am not condoning violence I, I'm not proud of myself, maybe necessarily for, for hitting the guy, but maybe I am because he hit me first. But one thing that I am really, really proud of is that I fought back. You see, I have this tendency in my life to withdraw from confrontation, to withdraw from conflict. It can feel so intense and scary for me. And you know, when we withdraw from conflict, and we run away from our problems, it can be so emasculating. And the reason that it's emasculating is because bravery is actually one of the most important growers of self-esteem. And our self-esteem is really important because if it's low, then we're actually gonna not let people get close to us because we don't want them to, to realize that we actually don't have anything to offer. So I'd rather keep people at a distance than let them get close to me and then ultimately reject me. I'll take it a step further. We have low self-esteem, and God comes down and he says, I died on the cross for you. I did this for you. And we think to ourselves, I'm not worth that, God, so I'm going to keep you away. And now we get our sense of esteem from who God says that we are. And that's a process that we have to work out, which means that we have to come to stuff like this to find out the truth of your identity that you are so sealed inside of him that he is for you. And when we start to believe that, it fills us with courage to, have to be able to deal with the things in our lives. I have a friend who, he's a writer in Hollywood. He, he writes stories for a living. And he was telling me that whenever he's writing a story, the number one element that he uses to either make an audience love a character or hate a character is the absence or the presence of bravery. It's like, think about that for a second. Any story, any movie, any TV show that you have ever watched, you usually see a main character who is fearful. He's confronted with a problem, and now he has to make the decision, am I going to go towards this thing, or am I going to run away? He goes towards it, and then he becomes the hero. The other side of that, you usually see someone who's selfish, who's fearful, who's always drawing back, and you have contempt for that person because you know that that's not the right thing to do because you are wise men. 
and that's inside of us. We respect bravery. You know, all of us are the main characters in our own stories. And so when we lack bravery, it's the same thing as watching a movie. We start to have contempt for ourselves, And then that creates a whole other laundry list of problems. And our confidence suffers. When I was with the Seahawks, we had this woman come in by the name of Angela Duckworth. And she wrote this best-selling book entitled Grit. And so she came, comes in and she's talking to us about grit. It's essentially this resilience, this inner dogged fight. It's your ability to endure pain. And she's saying how that grit is actually that if you look at somebody, if they're a gritty person, she can determine whether or not they're going to be successful in their life. Which makes sense because all of us are going to deal with something that doesn't go our way and how are we going to respond to it? We could give up or we could keep trying. And so here's an example of grit, of grit. I was listening to this podcast the other day, and this guy was sharing this true story. Um, and so what happened was this guy's at his house, and he lets his dog go out to go to the bathroom. And probably like an hour later, his dog comes back and is just covered in cuts. It's bleeding everywhere. It looks like Wolverine got a hold of this dog, or he got thrown into a blender. And so he freaks out, he takes his dog to the vet, he ends up having to get like 160 stitches. I mean, this dog was thrashed. He was a pit bull. And so the dog is starting to heal, and uh, a couple days later, he lets his dog go outside, and he starts to notice that, that his dog starts headed towards the back of his property. And it was, this was in California, and so there was a hill towards the back of his property. And the dog starts going up to the top of the hill, and so he just follows it. And he gets up to the top of this hill, and he looks around, and he sees not one dead coyote, not two dead coyotes, not five dead coyotes. At the top of this hill, there are nine dead coyotes. And this pit bull's just like, they shouldn't mess with me, man. <laughs> that dog is a savage. Like, what a beast. It's like he's fighting this one pit bull, he's ripping him, or fighting this one coyote, he's ripping him apart, and the other one's like on top of him. He's like, I'm going to take care of this one, and then I'm going to go to you, and then I'm going to go to you, and just one by one takes those things out. I need that dog to disciple me. <laughs> Teach me how to be a man. <laughs> That's what grit is. And so we have this woman, she's talking about grit, and at the end of it, she's like, you can actually go home and you can take a test and it will tell you how gritty you are. And I should not have done that. <laughs> I go home and I take this test, and throughout my life I've really struggled with, with negative self-talk. Just this voice in my head saying, you're not enough, you can't do it. And so I go home, I take this test, and at the end of the test, it says, congratulations. You scored higher than 20% of people in America. <laughs> Way to go, pal. That is really bad. And so I'm sitting there reading this thing, and it's like, it's one thing to feel defeated. It's another thing to have the expert on grit. She is a New York Times best-selling author, traveled all over the world, and the expert says, you're terrible at this. You have zero grit. But how many of you guys know that when the children of Israel were trying to get into the promised land, and God said, I want you to send 12 spies to go scout out the land, to bring back to the people, to tell them that this land is awesome, and that I'm giving it to them. 10 of those 12 came back and said, we can't have it. The people there, they're like giants. We were like grasshoppers in our own sight and also in theirs. Those 12 spies were the experts. And they ended up going around in the wilderness for another 40 years. And the only two senior citizens who made it into the promised land were Joshua and Caleb, 
the two that said, we can go up at once and take on these guys because we have a covenant with God where he swore in blood that he will never leave us, he will never forsake us. God has done all of this stuff that we've already seen him do. He will surely do it for us now. We can't trust the experts. God is the expert, and we have to believe what he has to say about us. And so I have one point today. If you have ever felt unqualified or insecure, it's right where you're supposed to be. Abraham, he slept with his maidservant. Moses, he had a stuttering problem. Samson, really liked the ladies. Jacob was a thief, and David was a murderer and an adulterer. There's this pattern here. All of Jesus' disciples, they were teenagers. They're looking at Jesus in the flesh, and they're like, I don't know if this is real. And he's like, it's okay. I want you to go into all the world and preach the gospel, for I'm going to be with you always. And they're like, all right. And then they go out and do it. We talk a lot about Peter denying Christ, and we forget that all of his disciples left him. They all were freaked out. And God took those people and he did something unbelievable through them. And then with those disciples, they have one encounter with Jesus and that encounter with Jesus changes them forever. They recommit to him and out of the 11 that were remaining because Judas hung himself, 10 of them were martyred. They died for their faith. They went from cowards to martyrs in a moment with one encounter with God. And when I think about our journey as men, I want to ask you guys the question is, have you had an encounter with Jesus like that? That fills you with such courage and confidence that you can boldly go into whatever he has called you to do. Despite feeling insecure, despite feeling doubtful, despite not knowing what your place is. You know, my, my book, I call it becoming because that word is an adjective and it's a verb. We're all becoming something, but to be becoming is to be attractive. And so what does it look like to like who you are when you haven't become the person that you're supposed to be? It's this aspirational pursuit, meaning that there's always more out in front of us. You know, I, uh, a couple years ago, I was training at this gym in Salt Lake City, and in Salt Lake City, they have this place, it's called Antelope Island. And on this place, they have one of the largest bison populations in the United States. And so my wife and I, we went out there and we drove up over this hill and we looked out over this pasture and there are just dozens of them out there. And we actually got really, really close to one of them. I'm probably from like me to the back of the room uh, in, in my car because I am trying to not get trampled. <laughs> And I, I just became fascinated with these things. And I started doing a little more research about them, and I found out something really, really interesting. If you have a bison and, let's say, a cow, which sort of looks like a bison, if you have two of them in the same pasture and a storm starts to roll in, a cow will look at the storm and it will actually run away from it, trying to outrun it. But the problem is, because it's going the same direction as the storm, it's just staying in the storm. Because it's running away from something that's scary. A bison, on the other hand, will actually head towards it. Even though knowing that that looks scary, I'm gonna to go towards it, because if I go towards it, I'm going to spend less time in it. And that applies to everything in our life. When something comes up in my life, do I have the courage to confront it or run away from it? Maybe for some of us, we've been in a problem for a long time. It could be that we're running away from it. And we have to have the courage to go at it. I wear this wristband and it's got all these bison facing in different directions because I wanna remind myself that no matter where something challenging comes from, I'm going to run at it because I know that who I really want to be is on the other side of the thing that I least want to address. Maybe it's a tough conversation with somebody. 
You know, maybe it's firing somebody. I mean, whatever it is in your life, there are a thousand examples of something that I just want to put that off because I don't want to deal with it. And that's exactly the thing that you need to deal with. I personally, I've just had it settled in my mind that I want to do some, one hard thing every day. You know, like one thing that I really don't want to do. I've kind of got this list of like three or four people who were like, for the last year, I've been feeling like I need to call these people and have a conversation. And so over the last week, I just day by day, I just went through it, I went through it, and I went through it. And it was never as hard as I thought it was going to be. It's like the anticipation of our greatest fears are way worse than the actualization of them. Am I right? Once we actually deal with it, it's like, oh, that wasn't so bad. And now I have the courage to go and do another thing because I've got experience. And I want to close with this story. Um, in my final year of my first contract, I, uh, I felt prompted to try and use the influence that I had to share the gospel in a compelling way. And um, over the summer, I, uh, I, I had this idea that I wanted to produce a film. Basically, this 15-minute long film interviewing different players and coaches on the Seahawks, and then ultimately getting to, this is why we play football, to honor and glorify Jesus. And uh, I was filming this in the middle of training camp, which, as Chad knows, is no small thing. You don't have a whole lot of spare time. And so in between meetings, I've, I've got like a film crew out here, and I'm grabbing one guy, and we're just trying to knock this thing out. And it was really, really intense. And I was actually in a very heated battle for my position at the time. They brought in a long snapper who was, honestly, he was way better than I was. He was way more athletic. He was way more consistent. He was way better looking than I was. And he was like the GQ model. And I'm just sitting here feeling like, man, I can't even compete with this guy. But then on top of that, a few months prior, I actually got diagnosed with major depressive disorder and panic disorder. Which panic disorder for your long snapper is not a good thing. <laughs> I'm trying to hide that from our general manager. I'm good, man. It's great. In that depression and anxiety, it brought me to this place of isolation and addiction and shame and feeling like I'm a total failure. And then all, in all the midst of that, feeling like God's telling me, I want you to do this. I want you to film this. And so I'm pouring tens of thousands of dollars into this project while I'm competing with this guy, while I'm feeling so ashamed and all of this stuff is going on. And then I'm thinking on top of that, like, I hope I make the team. You know, like, if I get cut, like, this is gonna be awkward. <laughs> like, trying to release this film. And I was really encouraged by this story in Mark chapter three. In Mark chapter three, you find this guy who has a withered hand. Essentially, he has a disability. And Jesus is with him on the Sabbath, and they're in the temple, and all of the Pharisees are watching Jesus to see whether or not they were going to heal him on the Sabbath so that they could accuse him. And, like, how ridiculous is that, you know? Like, here's this guy. He's so dealing with this problem. And, you know, I, I had really bad acne when I was in high school. And everywhere I walked, I felt like a bomb just blew up on my face. I, I, I hated myself. And honestly, it's probably part of the reason that I gravitated towards sports, because sports made me feel like I mattered. It gave me a sense of confidence, even though I really didn't like who I was. And so there's a good chance that this guy who has a disability is also feeling a little insecure. In fact, there was a time when Jesus' disciples asked Jesus about a blind man, is he blind because he sinned or because his parents sinned? And like the fact that that's even a question is such a bummer. It's like if he's blind because he sinned, then I'm going to self-righteously judge him because he obviously deserves this. So that was the mentality of the day. So this guy with his flipper on the side of his, his, his body is probably insecure. And so Jesus walks up to this guy who has something that he feels ashamed of, and he looks at him in front of all of these people, and he says, stretch out your hand. Now, 
If I'm that guy, I'm thinking, whoa, that's super offensive, man. <laughs> Stretch, like, are you making fun of me? Stretch out my hand? I literally cannot do that. And you're doing it in front of all of these people? But the Bible says that he took his hand, the thing that he felt ashamed of, and he stretched it out. And then all of a sudden, broop, it says that his hand was restored as whole as the other. He was brought back to a place of wholeness. And the reason that he was brought back to a place of wholeness was because he finally had the courage to bring that thing that he felt ashamed about and show it to somebody else. Now, all of us have a withered hand in some capacity, something that we feel ashamed of, something that if you knew this about me, you actually wouldn't like me. And so I'm going to put on a mask and, hey, hey, I'm all good, brother. Yeah, how can I pray for you? Let's talk about you. You have more problems than I do. We have to walk in courage. And so even though I'm dealing with all of this stuff during training camp while I'm filming this thing, there's a couple people that I'm coming to like every day. Mentors and friends saying, man, like I'm really struggling, exposing my withered hand. And then through the midst of all of that, God did something amazing. We released 28,000 copies of the film. We put together a team of about 200 people, passed out 28,000 copies of the film after one of our games. We put it up on YouTube. And within a fir the first week, it had like 100,000 views. And so it's this 15 minute long film. And at the end of it, it actually ends with, with me doing an altar call in the middle of the Seahawks stadium. And it's, this, it's super cool, like how it all came together. That guy ended up getting cut, uh, which I was praying him out in Jesus' name, <laughs> speaking death over him. <laughs> I think that it has, let's see, right now it's got about 724,000 views, but that number is a little bit misleading because it's like if 1,000 people watch one YouTube video, it counts as one view. And so we estimate that it's, it's in the millions. And another thing that's interesting about that is over the summer, I felt like the Lord told me to call it the making of a champion. And I had no idea that six months later, we would actually win the world championship. Yeah, we crushed the Broncos in that game. And it was sort of this beautiful serendipitous thing that God will honor those who honor him. And so God, he took this cowardly, selfish disappointment of a man and through his power introduced himself to millions of people. And so for all of us today, we have to ask the question of, do we have the courage to lead in spite of our flaws? It's our job to expose our withered hand, the thing that makes us feel insecure. And when we do that within community, it fills us with courage to be able to confront our storms instead of run away from them. Because who we want to be is on that side. And self-esteem comes from doing esteemable acts. When we do things that make us respect ourselves, that is an exponential growth. And if we truly want to be men, men of strength, I love what that Bible verse said, be a man, act like a man. Go towards the challenges of life. So let's pray. Jesus, thank you for this morning. God, I ask that you would continue to apply the word to our lives. Thank you, Father, that you are inviting us into partnership with you. Thank you, Father, that your word says that everything that we put our hand to will prosper. Help us, Father, to see ourselves the way that you see us, with our identity fixed in who you say that we are, not what the world says, because we know that when we truly believe who you say that we are, that we can do all things. We love you, God. Be with us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. amen.